I don't know about the weather in your region, but we have had endless rain here this week. So timely for the Parsha of Noach, upright man and builder of the ark. The word ark here in Hebrew is teva, and it appears to be of foreign origin, perhaps an Egyptian root, tbt, meaning a chest or a box. Indeed, we see from the shape of the vessel that it was a kind of boxy-looking thing. The Septuagint translation suggests that it was made from four square wood. The dimensions of 300 by 50 by 30 cubits prove it to be long and narrow. Although the flood story is highly disputed by many non-believing scientists, there is evidence in ancient cultures all over the world that such an event did occur. In 2014, Irving Finkel, a curator at the British Museum and overall entertaining fellow, came into the possession of a cuneiform tablet, which he translated. He discovered a hitherto unknown Babylonian version of the story of the Great Flood. This version gave specific measurements for an unusually large coracle, which is a type of round boat. A scale replica of the boat described in the tablet was built and floated in Kerala, India, and you can search for Finkel's discussion and see a video about it. However, there is no way that its round shape could fit the parameters of the biblical description. Furthermore, the word ark itself in English refers less to the genre of vehicle than to the purpose of it. It comes from a Latin root meaning to hold, to contain, to guard, a place for safekeeping, or even a secret place related to the word arcane, which means knowable or understood by only a few people. Surely Noah alone, or maybe his family, knew the purpose of the boat he was building. We don't see the word ark come into English Bible from the Latin until the 1520s Tyndale translation. Wycliffe simply used the word ship. The vessel which Noah built, according to the instructions, had a window or a skylight around the top and three decks. Although Noah gathered all the food, it appears that Yahweh himself gathered the animals. We understand that he did not need a representative of each of the 1.5 million species of animal life currently estimated by scientists to exist on our planet. For example, one cat would be enough to later develop into a tiger or a lynx, the ocelot or the cougar, and all the other members of the feline family. I'm not talking about evolution here. A cat is always a cat, but some grow larger and some smaller through a process called speciation, which occurs through the functions of mutation, natural selection, gene flow, and genetic drift. It seems like a very drastic measure for Yehovah to destroy literally all his creation, except for eight people and these representatives of each family of the animal kingdom. It has been hard to imagine that everything on the planet was so corrupt that he found such an action necessary. But as time goes by these days, we begin to see a glimpse of what that corruption might have looked like. There is only a remnant of the world worth saving, and the remnant is always small. There is another ark, a teva, in the scripture, but it is not always translated as ark. The basket of bulrushes, wherein Moses was placed as a small baby, is also a teva. How is it like Noah's ark? Both arks were havens for the preservation of the race, Noah's ark with the remaining humans and other life deemed necessary by the Creator for existence, and Moses' ark with the leader of Jehovah's people, to whom would be delivered his great Torah, his teaching and instruction, deemed necessary for the existence of people who would live according to his commandments. One ark so large, one ark so small. It is written in Second Peter 1.3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. There is another kind of ark altogether, and that is the one that you know as the Ark of the Covenant. This is a different Hebrew word, Aaron, which is not, by the way, related to the name of Aaron the Levite. It comes from the verb ara, which means to gather a collection there are a great many specific instructions for the creation of this ark, the kind of wood it is to be made from, the size, the method of carrying it, the mercy seat cover. All these things have significance, but I am not going to discuss those here. Here I only note what is in it, the tablets of the covenant, 
Aaron's rod that budded, and the pot of manna. I have talked elsewhere about how these things correspond to the items in the holy place and what they represent. Briefly, the manna corresponds to the office of the priest, who serves as the mediator between the people and Yahweh and maintains the fellowship. The tablets of the covenant represent the office of the prophet, who brings the word to the people. Aaron's rod represents the king, the ruler of the people. Again, the number three, we are told in Ecclesiastes 4.12, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And we can say again that these are the offices and tasks that are deemed necessary by Jehovah for the life and godliness of his people. In the shadow picture of Messiah, Moses embodies all three roles. He learned shepherding in the desert for 40 years under his father-in-law, Jethro. He was from the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, and he was the mediator between Jehovah and the people in the people's disputes with each other, shepherd of the flock. Like the king, he led the people through the wilderness and made right rulings. Like the prophet, he literally brought the words of Jehovah, including the ten words, the teachings and instructions. David also provides such a shadow picture. Of course, he is the literal king. He also was a shepherd in his younger years and serves as the priest when he brings the ark back to Jerusalem, as told in Second Samuel chapter 6. As far as being a prophet, one has only to read the many psalms that bring the word of Jehovah and also tell of future events. Fulfilling all these pictures, Yeshua walked with us, serving in all three roles. He is a Torah-giving king, not a new Torah, but proper interpretation of the one at Sinai. As he said in Matthew 5:17. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He is the prophet bringing the word and the warning of the future. Matthew 24, 4-8 And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Messiah, and shall deceive many. For ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. He is also the pastor, the shepherd, leading the people in the way they should go, and feeding the people on the word. John ten eleven. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Although not of the tribe of Levi, we are told that he is a priest on the order of Melchizedek. He is the mediator between the Father and the people, as it is written in 1 Timothy 2.5. Without tracing the history of what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, suffice it to say that in Solomon's time all that was left in it was the tablets of the covenant. As it is written in 1 Kings 8.9, there was nothing in the Ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when Jehovah made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt. We might ask, is there a prophecy hidden in these lost items? Directly after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom is divided and begins to break down. There is no longer one king, but there are two, and fighting between them ensues. The priests, the Levites, are divided among the territory, and their behavior deteriorates away from holiness. False prophets abound. Even the word, the book of the law, is lost altogether, but recovered in Josiah's time. Three hundred years later, the people are carried off to Babylon. When they return after seventy years, we do not see the kingship reinstituted. We see that the priests have married foreign women and must be purified. Later, during the times of the Maccabees, they made an attempt to rectify the temple service, which was in order because they were Levites. But then we see them try to control the rulership which was out of order. At this point, the Davidic line is unclear. Although the Levites and the Kohen still know who they are by their generations, they have no temple to serve in. All that is left for the people is the Torah, the teachings and instructions, the word of Jehovah. As Hosea prophesied in chapter 3, verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. There is another use of this word, aron, that appears in the narratives of Jehoiada, creating a chest for the collection of money to finance the repair and upkeep of the temple during the reign of Jehoash. 
It is simply a collection box. But there is one more Aaron in scripture. It is the box or coffin in which Joseph's bones are carried out of Egypt by Moses and back to the promised land by Joshua. Joseph had put the people under oath to accomplish this task, and they honored that oath all those many years later. What is the significance of Joseph coming back to the land? There are so many things to say about the relevance of Joseph to these shadow pictures. We must remember that he is a type of firstborn, 1 Chronicles 5.1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. He is a type of Yeshua in so many ways. Shepherd, stripped of his coat, unrecognized by his brothers, second command over the largest nation in the world at that time, savior of the world, and he represents the lost people of the kingdom of Ephraim. The significance of Joseph's bones is found in Ezekiel 37. First, we see that, yes, dry bones can live. They are resurrected before the eyes of the prophet. Then the bones of Joseph are joined with the bones of Judah to create one people. What a great and glorious vision. As it is written in Ezekiel 37:21, And say unto them, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. For us, there is always an ark of refuge. Proverbs 18.10 The name of Jehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. Psalm 57.1 Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. Indeed, in the shadow of your wings will I make my refuge until these calamities are overpassed and many other similar admonitions. And as for the Ark of the Covenant, it is written in Jeremiah 3.16, And it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, says Jehovah, they shall say no more, the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Once the living word is with us, the King of Kings, the High Priest according to the order of Melchizedek, There will no longer be any need for these representations. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my 